often pass it. Um, so the reason we made this video today is a lot of people have been focusing inherently on Andrew Yang being compared to Donald Trump. We think those claims are ridiculous. We can see the notion of the debatability of whether or not being someone from the business world and not having political experience matters. But we really wanted to focus on what is kind of Yang's position in, in regards to identity politics issues and the claim that in the media right now and from his opponents that he's a bigot. We flat out reject that claim and we want to establish that, you know, Yang's general approach is kind of a historical approach to how we've been trying to address uh, these different identity based politics. However, identity based politics have largely evolved over time to places that, in our opinion, are not exactly healthy right now. Yang's approach has mainly been on focusing on what unites us among our different groups rather than focusing on those divisions and that we should have community leaders from these different, you know, you know, interest groups. Uh, be the ones who are actually leading on what is necessary from uh, their communities and that they as a leader, like an Andrew Yang in this sense, is there to be supportive of them and be able to bolster their efforts, not necessarily dictate what is appropriate. This is largely in line with what that historical sense of identity politics was, which was more focusing on that we are all the same than that we are all inherently different. And this comes in a quote, as I mentioned before, you guys didn't get to hear it, but the quote came from MLK. Uh, which was basically that, you know, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. The note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is this sense of universalism, not necessarily inherently that we have to focus on particular groups, but that we are all entitled to certain benefits and that we all need certain things. He obviously says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But if you follow his career, you know that he is a major advocate for you know programs that are inherently anti-poverty, the establishment of a guaranteed minimum income, as well as a guarantee for work. We know that all people need housing. All people need health care. All people need education. There are these things that we all can see that we all need, regardless of how we identify our skin tone, our sexuality, our gender, and that these are the things that we should be bound together by and that we have inalienable rights that we should be recognizing and that when we are not meeting that end of a universal treatment of people, that we should be looking to rectify this. However, things kind of evolved out of that era of the 70s uh, as Ronald Reagan and kind of like the culture war kind of really began in the 80s. And, you know, we had a lot of the conservative movement start to frankly be willing to embrace some of what MLK was saying, but they used this to cynical ends, which basically denied that there was any systematic uh, discrimination within it or injustices. And they basically said, oh, no, the system is race blind at this point. What, what are you guys complaining about? There's no inherently racist law. And so this kind of caused an evolution of the identity politics movement, coupled with the fact that even from like the Democratic side of the aisle, things were largely dominated by white liberal voices as well. Um, so they basically said, OK, we now need to have it less be about the like race blindness and that we're all the same. And we need to start actually having people recognize the differences in treatment. Um, so, you know, this also is coupled with largely a, a refocusing of political issues now that the end of this Cold War was uh, coming to fruition. You know, there's a lot of talk and focus on economic issues and foreign policy, um, primarily because we were constantly having this debate between socialism and capitalism and on the grand stage of the global, um, you know, scale. Uh, so now that we are focusing a little bit more domestic, the Cold War was wrapping up and we were no longer having this big socialism versus capitalism divide, a lot of people started to focus again on these identity-based factors. Um, and so this kind of, we brought up this quote from an Oberlin professor, Sonia Kruk, who says, quote, what makes identity politics a significant departure from earlier movements is its demand for recognition on the basis of the very grounds on which recognition has previously been denied. It is qua women, it is qua black, it is qua lesbians that group demand recognition. The demand is not for inclusion within the fold of universal humankind, nor is it for respect in spite of one's differences. Rather, what is demanded is respect for oneself as different. 
So this is inherently breaking from this idea that we are all the same. And they have now basically established that we are all different, but we should be still able to respect each other despite all those differences. And so this is largely, you know, reached a kind of more exacerbated place, you know, for much of the left today, you know, anyone who speaks in favor of, you know, this idea of us having these universal commons or kind of like this group blindness is considered on the other side or, you know, considered indifferent to the to the blights of these other communities or even frankly, they'll be accused of being guilty of oppression themselves. Uh, for some, you know, especially like I'll admit in my own experience, like uh, on college campuses, um, you know, if you don't kind of swallow this whole idea of anti-oppression kind of orthodoxy, you're you're deemed a racist. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not in the slightest denying that there is not systematic inequality. We've talked about that plenty on the program. But it is to basically say that you cannot have any nuance in this discussion or provide any pushback without being labeled as the oppressor. And I think that is a dangerous way of thinking. Um, you know, we even had this coming back in the past. We've had many like uh, a lefty icon have this come to them. You know, in 2016, um, I remember like uh, it was Bernie Sanders who basically was like, uh, you know, referencing how it's not good enough to just say like, hey, I'm a Latina, vote for me. Um, and how basically, uh, who was it? It was someone on the Hillary Clinton team. Um, I think it was, it was Quentin something. I, I forget his last name. I apologize. But it was Qu some Quentin on, on her team basically uh, made the accusation that he is basically a white supremacist. Uh, and it, it comes to this kind of idea that kind of feels like the boy who cried wolf. There is inherently still wolves within this place. But if you keep calling these things that aren't inherently discrimination or bigotry as such, people stop listening because they think that, oh, this isn't really a serious problem. You're overreacting to this nothingness. And so I think we really need to kind of lock in on, you know, being realistic with what are the inherent problems and also knowing when is someone just being an absolutely ridiculous reactionary. Um, and so to come back now, let's circle back to the Andrew Yang and like the New York City race. You know, this has been coming as a levy uh, against Andrew Yang, primarily, as I said, from Maya Wiley and kind of like the liberal camp, kind of Scott Stringer has even made his own implications as such with his comments about like, Yang should not be trying to tweet first and like think of ideas second. Like he should think before he speaks. Like there is this implication that they are trying to frame him as um, basically Donald Trump. And I would say that even their own records, I'd say, hey, like, do we really want to go down this path of bad mouthing each other uh, on these issues? We can go into Maya Wiley's record about the de Blasio administration and how she was basically the main advisor through two of his biggest scandals. Uh, you know, from solicitation of donations from entities within city businesses, as well as uh, shielding communications from outside political advisors who she dubbed like agents of the city, which kind of implies that sometimes this identity politics is frankly being used to be shields for actual corruption. Uh, and then you have the people like Scott Stringer, who frankly, we can even go on an identity politics front. The dude hired uh, Mika Lasher as his campaign manager. The dude is an outwardly racist person in his past campaigns uh, and has been accused of such by Reverend Al Sharpton even during this cycle uh, when uh, he was announced as Scott Stringer's campaign manager for basically using very racist tropes uh, in, I think it was a 2001 race. Um, who was running? It was, um, some. I think it was, Miss, I forget the first name. It was Green. I think it was Green in 2001 where they basically had pictures of this candidate, I think it was Green, basically ass kissing uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, who was also made incredibly overweight in the photo as well. Um, and so he has been called on this. He's also been called on uh, being like privy in a lot of the other communications that have been coming out in like reports to the New York Post. Uh, so it's like there is damaging things that we can really start doing this game. But Andrew Yang doesn't want to do this approach in getting into the mud. He wants to focus on his positive vision. And I'm not even bringing up Eric Adams. There's a whole litany of things that we can be said, like supporting Louis Farrakhan, supporting Stop and Frisk. Um, he said that, like, people who are non-natives should go move back to Iowa and Ohio. 
Oh God, what else is he? Oh, oh, he he has con he condemned a past opponent of his, um, Her Herman Badillo, uh, uh, for interracial marriage. He said he should have married a Latina instead of a Jewish woman. Uh, dude was even a Republican until the late nineties. Uh, so like. I can say these things, but th the real focus of the Yang campaign has been focusing on his own positive message. And so I want to talk about some of the things where it's just clear that Yang himself doesn't fit that caricature. You know, the most recent one, which is what kind of inspired me to make this video, which it felt like, okay, they're doing the culmination of let's get all the different bigotry groups that we want to throw at Yang under one sun. Uh, he got recently criticized for some comments that he had made at an LGBTQ uh, forum with the Stonewall Democrats. And so, you know, I think it's it's very clear. I, I watched that interview myself that he is not a bigot. I'll admit, I think he had some statements that made him seem a little bit less comfortable working with that group than um, some other people might be. I think he came off a little bit of corny and frankly, kind of came off giving a very suburban vibe. That, that's how I'm going to put it out there. But under no circumstance did anything that he said there come even close to bigotry, not even close. It could be corny versions of love. Like I think he had said, like, you're all very beautiful and very human. All again, compliments. And like, he has no like gripes with these communities where, you know, he has a large level of representation within his campaigns. Uh, his two campaign managers, Chris Coffey, as well as Sasha Nuja. Uh, are both members of the LGBTQ community. His past co uh, campaign co-chair uh, from his presidential run, Evan Lowe, is a member of the LGBTQ community. Uh, and frankly, he's talked about many times in the past about how the community needs support on issues such as being able to build up financial independence because, well, the LGBTQ community is a group that, frankly, does face the persecution of being kicked out of their homes, from their families, as well as uh, even in school environments as well. And so they need extra support in having this financial independence. And so one of the things you're going to kind of get from what I'm saying here throughout this is that largely a lot of these groups have common needs. And the, the common need a lot of the times is financial independence. So yeah, I, I think it's going to be, you know, uh, really hard for people to try and land Andrew Yang as a bigot against the LGBTQ community. Uh, the next was when this kind of attack line really got officialized was Maya Wiley using this when accusing Andrew Yang of being uh, a misogynist. And I, I find this very weird given a lot of Yang's past rhetoric. Um, you know, he's brought attention to the value of stay at home parents. He regularly talks about the predominant role of women uh, in the domestic workforce going uncompensated. Uh, he was famous at one of his debates for saying, like, if you get too many uh, men alone and leave us alone for a while, we kind of become morons. Uh, he committed to be uh, to a female vice president. And also he announced he wants to have a female deputy mayor and Catherine Garcia. He supports equal pay. He supports paid family leave. He supports subsidizing childcare. He supports uh, marriage counseling. He supports subsidizing more the programs that are supporting single uh, mothers who are taking care of their children. Uh, he is an absolutist on free choice on abortion and wants to codify Roe v. Wade into law. He talks about the need for uh, public investment into doulas and midwives. Uh, he has talked about how even automation itself is disproportionately going to be impacting women's jobs. And he's even tried to help do leadership for men, trying to redefine what being a strong man means in that he has says strong men treat women well. And so I think it's, it's again, very hard to like say that he is some uh, misogynistic individual. And I, I'm not even going to throw in the things like supporting his own wife, because that's like commonplace for any man to be able to do. But, you know, he certainly has been willing to help his wife get her story out there for her own sexual assault. And so it, it really pains me to see how much he is maligned as this misogynist for comments where he was simply laughing at a joke that some comedian told that he did not even repeat the words of. I'll admit, if I'm in that situation, yeah, I don't love the language, but I'm not going to be trying to call him out. I'm going to be laughing off addressing it once. And if he keeps it up, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to leave the scenario. I'm going to be like, I don't agree with this. This is not like my character at all. I don't feel comfortable here. Uh, and so I find that to be 
um, frankly, very ridiculous as well. And so now I want to go to the next point. They, they're now going to characterize him on the being a racist. And so let, let, let's go into the record of what has Yang done for some of these communities. Let's let's go with the, the black community first. Uh, so he has been on record many times of going to the Black Lives Matter rallies, supporting um, the cause of protest against police brutality. Uh, he has been documented at those events many times, unfortunately, once being called out for being there for a photo op, which, oh, God, what, what a cynical perspective of the two people who yelled him out of that event while simultaneously welcoming in all these other candidates to do their freaking photo ops, especially even Eric Adams, who is still a supporter of Stop and Frisk. It was pretty gross when that happened. But back on topic. He also did efforts uh, while he was in between running for president as well as between mayor in trying to provide cash relief. The main levels of this being provided to the Bronx, uh, which is a predominantly black neighborhood. Uh, he has regularly talked about how the black community is expected to reach um, 50 percent of their community, reaching a net zero net worth by the year 2050. Uh, he had been doing a lot of uh, fundraising to support local organizers, specifically black local organizers in Georgia with, um, what's it called, Defeat by Tweet, which was a thing that was going to help fundraise for those groups. Um, he has had a ton of support from uh, the black community itself. Um, some really, frankly, impressive endorsements from it, you know, from the first time being politically recognized, it was by Barack Obama, our first black president. He was awarded uh, the Global Ambassador of Entrepreneurship. He was endorsed by uh, MLK III, who is now his campaign co-chair in the New York City race. He's been endorsed by Dave Chappelle, uh, Donald Glover, um, uh, Eric B. and Rakeem, the Fat Boys, um, Anita Baker, um, Hannibal Burris, Donnell Rawlings, um, Dominique, Dominique Wilkins, uh, Marcellus Wiley, um, Antonio Bryant, um, Van Jones. Uh, and then, uh, oh yeah. And then there's even like the political candidates that he endorsed, uh, like Jermaine Johnson, who won his race in South Carolina. Uh, Erica Rhodes, who's running out in California. Uh, Reverend Wendy Williams, who is uh, in DC. Um, then you have even like campaign staff. Like I know I've been working, frankly, like talking with the campaign team, like Erica MacLeod, who's working with their staffing. Um, hell, I think like, if I'm not mistaken, Yang even had like the person who was constantly providing his security. Um, what's his name? Tyreek uh, as his body man. Uh, so he has constantly been supportive of the black community. And I, I would I would challenge anyone who says that he is there to just pander to be like, OK, like, are you not just being a cynical political right now? Like, get get to know the man. He actually has genuine love for these communities. And like, let's take a moment to compare these things to like Donald Trump. Because that's the thing. We made this whole video because they're literally calling him a mini Trump. Let's compare. What, what is Trump doing in comparison? Well, let, let, let's let's take specifically for the black community. Uh, 1973 is like the first thing where we really got to focus in is that he's being literally sued for discriminatory housing policy for the buildings that he was managing. And they were he was fined severely for that. Basically, they found that he was refusing to rent to black tenants and lied to black applicants about whether apartments were available. Uh, then you had in 1980, uh, Kip Brown, a former employee of uh, the Trump castle, accused another one of Trump's businesses of discrimination. He said, you know, when Donald and Ivana came to the casino, the bosses would order all the black people off the floor, Brown said. Quote, it was the 80s. I was a teenager, but I remember it. They put us all in the back. Then you had 1989. Uh, you know, this is a controversial case. Uh, it's called the Central Park Five. And this was basically, uh, there was this person who was attacked uh, and, and raped and they were a jogger. And basically he put out a full length paper ad saying that these people were basically guilty. Uh, these people eventually were arrested, but later found to be innocent later on. Uh, and he was asked if he was like basically had any remorse now that the DNA evidence cleared these people. And he basically said, no, he still thought that they had done it. Um, then you have 1991 uh, in a book by John O'Donnell, uh, the former president of uh, Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino basically was quoted saying that, you know, quote, black guys counting money. I hate it. 
The only kind of people I want counting my money are short guys that wear yamukles every day. I think that guy is lazy, and it's probably not his fault because laziness is a trait in blacks. It really is. I believe that it's not anything they can control. And that was a quote by Donald Trump, uh, according to his basic manager of the Trump Plaza Hotel. And, you know, even in the 1997 Playboy interview, when he was asked about this stuff, he said, you know, it was probably true that he had said it. Um, it can keep going on. 1992, the Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino had to pay a $200,000 fine because it transferred black and women dealers off their tables to accommodate a big time gambler's prejudices. Uh, he keeps going. 2005. Trump publicly pitched what was essentially the apprentice white people versus black people. Uh, he, he basically said he wasn't really happy with the recent seasons. And so he was considering an idea that was fairly controversial in his mind, creating a team of successful African-Americans versus a team of successful whites. Whether people like that idea or not it is somewhat reflective of our very vicious world. Um, and then we can keep going. There's the birtherism under Barack Obama. There is basically calling Colin Kaepernick like a son of a bitch uh, for his protests in, in stance with black lives. Uh, there is him calling, um, oh, what's it? They're basically saying like all the people who came from like Haiti in like 2017, they all have AIDS. Uh, in 2018, he basically said like, you know, why are we having all these people from shithole countries come here when referencing African nations? And so, like, the notion <laughs> that, that this is comparable to Andrew Yang is just ridiculous. Um, and let's go one further, because this is more for the Scott Stringer people out here who now are suddenly going with this line that um, Andrew Yang is suddenly uh, anti-immigrant. Um, you know, very repeatedly in the past, this has been Andrew Yang's rhetoric on it. He's tried shifting the narrative from blaming immigrants for any job losses to robots. He's repeatedly shared resources of what people's rights are when um, ICE shows up. He is the son of immigrants. He advocated increasing uh, both the immigration and refugee quotas. He has talked up the vital contributions of the immigrant community, especially for um, aspects of entrepreneurism, as well as uh, supporting of our food systems. Uh, he supports the DREAM Act. He supports a pathway to citizenship. Um, and even this moment where he's being criticized as anti-immigrant by the Stringer team, like for the whole like uh, going after illegal vendors, uh, this, this is what he had said in that moment. Like, quote, I'd like to bring more unlicensed vendors into the legal market. Education for immigrant and non-English speaking vendors on rules of vending, opening more spaces for legal outdoor vending, working with small businesses to broker tensions all would help. All he is saying there is basically, let's help you get legal. <laughs> like, that's not a controversial thing. That's not an anti-immigrant thing. And when you even press Scott Stringer at the whole press conference that he had on this issue, okay, are you going to do enforcement? Are you going to lift the cap? He was not willing to admit to wanting to, you know, release the cap on street vendors. And so if you have a cap on street vendors, then you have to do enforcement. Otherwise, why should someone have to go through the legal system? Well, like, we want to have consistency in our standards. So either you have to completely release the cap or you have to do some level of enforcement and do it in a humane way. You're not being punitive. You're helping people enter the legal system. And I find it even funny because even at Scott Stringer's event, and I don't know why any of the media didn't like do this. I'm very happy that Liz Smith did this. Um, she is someone now who's trying to help the Yang campaign in an you know, unofficial capacity. She pointed out that at the event, people got arrested. These street vendors got arrested at the event too. He basically set them up in a place to get themselves in danger. Uh, it, so it's, it's kind of ridiculous that he wants to make this a whole anti-immigrant case. And when you look at Yang's platform, Go for it. We've done a whole four-hour breakdown. So trust me, we've read it. He reemphasizes over and over again how all benefits that he talks about in his platform would be eligible for all and how New York City would be a true sanctuary city. And this is why he's even been able to garner endorsements from groups, or not from groups, but from previous candidates like uh, Carlos Menchaca, who, when it came to his three biggest issues, 
Immigration was his number one thing on his platform that we covered. So this notion that he's suddenly anti-immigrant, again, falls flat on its face. And I'm not even going to go with the idea of let's compare this to Donald Trump, the guy who basically said that, like, we need a, a total shutdown of Muslims entering the country or and referred to Mexicans as rapists. Don't get me freaking wrong. Like, this is an obviously on its face stupid comparison. And Stringer and Wiley should feel stupid for it. Their bases should feel stupid for supporting people who would say such a thing. And so I ask yourself, what, what's the value of this modern, you know, identity politics, this exclusionary sense of, you know, you have to recognize all of our differences. And if you're not from us, you're basically out of touch and you should not be, you know, welcomed within it. Um, I say that it creates a very negative counter identity politics. Uh, that's frankly existed for a while and gets exacerbated the more we divide ourselves into tribes, which is white identity politics, which frankly gets embraced a lot by the right. And I'm going to give a quote um, from a piece in the American Conservative done by Rod Dreher talking about this subject, because I legitimately want to give you all what is the actual perspective that they give, not us making assumptions about what they believe, what they actually believe for why they do these things. So he is quoted as such, quote, I'm a white guy. I'm a well-educated intellectual who enjoys small art house movies, coffee houses, and classic blues. If you didn't know any better, you'd probably mistake me for a lefty urban hipster. And yet, I find some of the alt-right stuff exerts a pull even on me. Even though I'm smart and informed enough to see through it, it's seductive because I am not a person with any power or privilege, and yet I am constantly bombarded with messages telling me that I am cancer. I'm a problem. Everything is my fault. I'm a very lower middle class. I've never owned a car and do my own home repairs as much as I can to save money. I cut my own grass, wash my own dishes, buy my clothes from Walmart. I have no clue how I will ever be able to retire. But oh boy, brother, do I hear the media tell it? I am just drowning in unearned power and privilege. And America will be a much brighter, more loving, more peaceful nation when I finally just keel over and die. Trust me, after all that, some of the alt-right stuff feels like a warm, soothing bath. A safe space, if you will. I recoil from the uglier stuff. But some of it, the, hey, white guys are actually okay, you know be proud of yourself, white man, stuff is, you know, really very seductive. And it is only with some intellectual effort that I can resist the pull. If it's a struggle for someone like me to resist the pull, I imagine it's probably impossible for someone with less education or cultural exposure. And again, that was a quote from Rod Dreher in his piece in the American Conservative. As core, you know, the problem is, is simple, but fundamental, you know, um, well, Black Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, Jewish Americans, and many others are allowed or indeed encouraged to feel solidarity and take pride in their racial or ethnic identity, white Americans for the last several decades have told that they never are allowed to do this. And so what happens is people further kind of coming into these buckets cause a lot of these people on the other side of the aisle to start really identifying with the white community because these other groups have already identified them as such. And mind you, this is not saying that all uh, white supremacy and white identity politics comes from a reaction to other identity politics. That stuff has long origins. But I do believe that it does exacerbate the problems and forms this notion of, you know, you should be judged first and foremost by the skin color, your gender, before we know if you're allowed to participate in the conversation and learn. And so I think that this has been inherently destructive to the cause of the progressive movement. And then it is basically losing us the ability to build a true working class coalition. Um, and so I think we need to be embracing kind of a similar mindset to Yang in that we should be emphasizing what are those common struggles that we all face, but also still noting how the solutions are going to be able to help those that are most disenfranchised most. Universal basic income is wonderful like that. Everyone is still receiving kind of an equal benefit. But of course, if you have no money, gaining an additional $1,000 is going to mean way more to you than if you already had, let's say, $100,000 and you now receive 1000 bucks. 
that's a great way for us to be able to rectify the existing system. And I highly encourage more people to embrace this sense of identity of trying to come together as an identity of the human race. We are more common, you and I, than we are different. And I will hope that we can continue to build these common grounds and establish more of these universal basics of income, services, and rights. So with that being said, everyone, I'm glad that you all joined us today for our video breaking down why Andrew Yang is not Donald Trump. So with that being said, we want to encourage you all, let us know what your thoughts. Did we miss anything of like areas where Andrew Yang has been a champion for all these groups that we've been covering? Do you have feelings about identity politics that you want to share? Please leave those in the comment section below for us to be able to see and hopefully respond back to. Likewise, hit the like button and the share to, you know, make sure that you help that people's basics movement uh, grow. And that being said, my friends, I hope you all are going to stay classy out there, my basic people. Uh, I hope you have a great day as well. And we will be back again on Monday. It'll be at 11 a.m. next week. Uh, and then the following week after that, we're going to be moving to regularly at 2 p.m. So that being said, my friends, I hope you stay classy out there, my basic people.